take your Bibles and turn them to Acts chapter 8. We're going to pick up with verse 26 and work our way through the rest of Acts chapter 8 as we continue to see some of the immediate aftermath of the, the persecution that breaks out and then as the gospel is going out from Jerusalem to various places, Acts chapter 8 starting with verse 26. And as you're finding that, remember that where we have been, we've seen uh, the gospel go out to the Samaritans, and Philip has been involved in that. He went and he preached, and, and people came to, to Christ. And the Holy Spirit came, and then Peter and John came, and, and they saw, they, they agreed, and were praising God for it. And so Philip has been in Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem, to preach. And then we pick up where we are today. And so we find this. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. Or perhaps a better way to translate that is go south to the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of those little side points that we have lots of fun in Bible studies, in, in biblical studies, trying to sort out is exactly what to do with some of these statements. There's really not that many roads there, but you know it's, it's just clear that he's going out into the desert. He's going out the wilderness way. So he got up and went. There he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, sitting in his chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah. Now here's a spot where, as you read your Bible, you can assume things that aren't stated plainly. One of them is this. He's got a chariot driver. Okay, this is not biblical justification to text and drive, y'all. Well, the Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading Isaiah with one hand and driving his chariot with the other. I can get on Facebook with one hand and drive with the other. No, he's an important official. He's got a driver. Okay, this is an important guy. This is not, a, this is not the big, you know, this is not the war chariot kind of thing. This is... You know, this is more of the carriage type of mindset. He's sitting in the back being driven around, and while he's driving, he, while he's being driven, he's, he's reading. You can just kind of read that in and understand what's happening. It doesn't have to say it. The Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran up to it and heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Now this is how you know that the Lord is at work, because for many of us, if we had to run up to a chariot, it would come out like this. Do you understand what you read? And then we can tell. The man replied, how in the world can I unless someone guides me? As opposed to his response to, you know, me, which would have been, do I need to get the AED from back there in the hall? You don't sound good. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with them. Now the passage of scripture the man was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In humiliation, justice was taken from him. Who can describe his posterity? For his life was taken away from the earth. Now this is from Isaiah 53. And sometime this week, read Isaiah 53 and be reminded of how clearly Isaiah saw what Jesus would be doing for us. It's from this passage that we get, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, which is then followed like this. By that. The Ethiopian eunuch says to Philip, please tell me, who is the prophet saying this about? Himself or someone else? So Philip started speaking and beginning with this scripture, proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. Now, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What is to stop me from being baptized? By the way, if you wonder why the detail of it's a desert road is important, there's your verse that tells you why it's important. The fact that there's water there, as you studied it, the fact that there's water, they, they come across water. It's not like driving from here to El Dorado. Where there's water, water everywhere. Okay? This is driving across, you know, this is going across New Mexico. 
and there's water. So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now we'll take this side note. Unless he's immersing the guy and it's a lot of water, this is an example, this is a biblical example of baptism the way we as Baptists say it should be done. Because otherwise you don't have to both go down into the water. You can go get your little cup and pour it on his head. But this is an example of, we see this as the Ethiopian eunuch here is baptized fully. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him anymore but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, found himself at Azotos, and as he passed through the area, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So what's going on here? Well, it's a fairly straightforward piece of narrative, a fairly straightforward story. Philip is done preaching in Samaria. How does he know this? The Samaritans don't tell him he has to go. The disciples don't tell him he has to go. He doesn't say, you know, I've gotten bored with Samaria. I'd like a different challenge. He's going on about his business, preaching, preaching, sharing the gospel, and yet the Holy Spirit comes and says, by the way, it's time for you to go. Now, if Philip was truly a, you know, a Baptist like a lot of us Baptists sometimes are, he'd be like, okay, good, I get to go someplace important now. I get to preach in front of big crowds. The Spirit says, no, I need you to go down this desert road, the road from Jerusalem down into Gaza on its way out of town. The road that nobody likes to stop on. Why? Because it's a good place for bandits to hang out. It's not exactly the safest road in the world at the time. If you're out there kind of in the wilderness, there's not any restaurants nearby. <laughs> There's no McDonald's. There's no Chick-fil-A. There's no place to stop for a snack. There's not a coffee shop or anything of the sort. Please leave aside the historical inaccuracy that nobody drinks coffee for another like thousand years. But anyway, uh, the uh, this is what this is. Go out there into the wilderness. He does, and he encounters this man, and, and he is described as a eunuch and an official of Queen Candace, and that he is coming back from having worship in Jerusalem. So what we have here is someone who is a complete foreigner. Unlike the Samaritans earlier in the chapter, who are half breeds you know, they've got a connection to the people of Israel. There's just a long-standing, 700-year-old feud that they don't get along. But beyond that, they're at least, you know, distant relations. He is from what is labeled at the time as Ethiopia. It's probably not exactly where modern-day Ethiopia is. It's probably more of Sudan uh, in, in that part of the, the country. It's up the Nile, uh, upriver in the Nile, just outside of Egypt. These are people that have fought with the Egyptians for centuries. Um, and in fact, they still don't really get along with the Egyptians, but we're not here for current events. And on top of that, he's a eunuch, and we're not going to get into those details, uh, but feel free to ask Scott when he's back to choir practice if you don't understand that term. Usually I put that on the deacons, but I thought we'd share, we'd share, share the screen this year, this uh, other time. Uh, so he's a, you know, he's in a high official who's not going to have a family. He's not going to have posterity to leave behind him. That's the whole purpose of that. Uh, you can't be distracted by the opposite sex, and you can't, you're can't. you not going to be corrupt enough to kind of try to pass on to your offspring instead of find somebody who knows what they're doing to take over for you. But he's gone all the way up to Jerusalem to worship. This is not a short trip. This is not an easy trip. It's crossed a couple of national boundaries to get there because he's outside of the Roman Empire. Now, Egypt, especially the part close to the Mediterranean, is inside the Mediterranean, is inside the Roman Empire. So he's had to come through, be allowed to come into the Roman Empire, which they're kind of picky about who they let in and who they don't let in. And then he's passed through a couple of regions there to go worship in Jerusalem. And now he's going back. 
This guy did not get up in the morning and say, you know what I think I'll do today? I think I'll go to Jerusalem to worship. He would have had to plan this weeks in advance, probably months in advance, because it would have taken weeks to make the trip. He has to have permission of the queen of the whole country to go because he's in charge of the treasury. Okay? This is a big deal. Now, they may not have the same rules there about the treasury that we have in the state of Arkansas. Did you know, for example, in the state of Arkansas, that you can go to the state treasurer's office when the state capitol is open and ask to see the money? And the Arkansas state constitution requires the treasurer to keep a certain amount of money on hand. And they will take you into the vault at the Capitol and let you hold the money. Then you have to put it down and leave. They do not let you take it with you. But they let you know, they'll let you hold. The, United, the, the state of Arkansas has a certain amount of cash reserve required by the state constitution. And the state treasurer has to have somebody in his office, in that office, at the vault, at the Capitol, during normal business hours, at all times, who has, the, who has the ability to let you in to see the money. It's required by law. You go to State Capitol on Wednesday because they're closed because they had a fire in one of the, the cafes. Got smoke everywhere. But you, they're supposed to be open by Wednesday. You go on Wednesday, go to the State Capitol and ask to see the money. And if they say, you can't see the money, you go down the hall to the Attorney General's office and say, they're breaking the law three doors down. You can. That's how tight being the state treasurer is in a state like Arkansas. This guy is the royal treasurer. He can't just leave. Because when the queen says, I need the money, she can, hey, I need a check for this. And, well, we, we, nobody's here that can sign one. What? Well, he left for Jerusalem three weeks ago. We expect him to be back in about six weeks. Be like, look, you, with the sharp pokey thing, go tell him not to come back ever. Somebody else is going to be in charge. So this has taken some effort for him to go and worship. He takes his faith in God seriously. Because he is moving his life around being present to worship. One of the things that we have lost in a lot of ways is that sense of importance of moving our life around being present to worship. Now some of that is because we, we live in a 24 hour a day, 7 day a week world. And it can be very difficult for some people to make a consistent 11 o'clock Sunday morning worship time. Because everybody, nobody wants the fire department saying, hey, get back to us after the invitation. We're coming up on three years from me having to roll to the emergency room in the middle of church. I didn't want to get there and knock on the door and there'd be a little sign that says, hang on. The preacher went into overtime. So one of the things that we as God's people need to start looking at are ways that we can make sure that people have the opportunity to worship that help make our 24-hour a day, 7 day a week, 365 day a year lives possible. Instead of saying, but if you don't block out this one hour, then we just, you know, we, we have this, this is the only time you can gather with us and worship. But the other side of it is that we ought to make that a priority, that we are planning to be in worship. Several preachers I know are fond of saying and post all the time on Facebook and such, Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. And the number of times people, well, we were going to make it, but you know, we went out and we did this, we did that, we did this other, and sir, for too much longer, we were just out so late on Saturday night, we couldn't get up Sunday morning. Well, if your priority is the other things, that's fine, but you can't then turn around and claim my priority is to be in church. It's just that I always have something else get in the way of my priority. In that case, the something else is far as your priority. 
And I'm not talking about missing from time to time. That happens to all of us. Okay? I'm talking about the, when we don't make it the habit. And one of the things that you can see in many churches is the ongoing after effect of the fact that parents, for a lot of years, didn't make church a priority. And as a result, their children don't even consider it an option. And so then they just do other things. But the eunuch has made time to worship. He has made certain that he was there. And now, as he goes, he's continuing to follow up on the things that he has heard and seen. He's reading the scripture. He knows the book of Isaiah. He's reading from the scroll. He's putting some effort into it. And Philip comes. The Spirit says, the Spirit that has, the Holy Spirit that has told him to go down to the road, now tells him, go catch up to that chariot. Stick close to it. And so there he is, alongside the chariot. And again, you can probably picture that this wasn't exactly easy. This guy is an important official of the Queen's government. He likely has some people around him kind of giving him that bubble. You don't think it's, you know, I mean, he's got to be kept safe. Philip works his way up close. He hears him reading the scripture and says, so, do you understand this? And the guy says, you know, I, I no. <laughs> so let's talk about a couple of important things here. Number one, it is okay to not know and not understand what you're reading. When you crack open your Bible, it is okay to not understand parts of it. But when somebody then looks at you and says, do you understand what you're reading? Don't, don't get practical and say, oh, yeah, I understand all of it perfectly. You'll never get answers to questions you refuse to ask. This guy admits in, in, in his humility and perhaps in his frustration, he admits, I don't get it. And unless somebody can explain it to me, I don't think I'll ever figure it out. And Philip then does what we would hold is the most important tradition and thing that we do with Scripture. He takes what he has learned how he knows Jesus and how he knows scripture and starts with the guy where he is and walks it from that point through what has happened to the point of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, rising up from the grave on the third day, ascending to the right hand of God the Father. And I do not doubt that Philip went ahead and said, and by the way, he's coming back eventually and y'all will even see it down there. Philip takes him walking through all of scripture from the point that he was at. In the same way that Jesus took the two disciples on the road to Emmaus there at the end of, at the end of Luke and walked them through all the scriptures so that they would understand what was going on. So Philip takes and walks it through. So what do we see about this from Philip? We see that Philip knows scripture. Philip is not standing there going, Isaiah, Isaiah, is he one of the... Where, you know, it, what... I don't think I've heard of Isaiah. Now, if you haven't heard of Obadiah, that's okay. We pick on Obadiah a lot, and you don't have to know Obadiah. You don't have to know Habakkuk real well. But Isaiah's got a lot of good things to say, and especially in that era, they would have known Isaiah. He knew Scripture. And not only did he know Scripture... He knew how it fit together. He didn't just have a pole line here and there where he could just throw this one line out there. You've heard it from me on Sunday morning. You've heard it from me on Wednesday night. Your kids have heard it from me so much that they probably, you know, it, they, don't, they, it, they could put it as a tattoo and it would be easier to forget. And that is that all Scripture has a context. It all goes together. And if you don't know what's going on in the whole thing, you can't really claim to know what's going on in one line. Because otherwise, you kind of miss the point. So it's important to know all of it. Philip knows it and is able to walk the Ethiopian man through.
through it. From this point forward. So as they explain and as they talk, then the man looks up and he sees water and he says, well, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? Philip says, I don't see a reason not. Why not? They stop. Philip baptizes. Because he's come to faith in Christ. He comes to an understanding in that short period of time that of all the things that he's been looking for, all the worship that he has pulled, pulled, poured out, all of this effort that he has done, he's finally found the fullness of the answer. And so he says, what, what is to stop me from being baptized? This is a spot where you throw it back in the Elizabethan English, you know, what hindereth me? What stops me? And so with that, I would raise us this question. Why are you waiting? You see, the eunuch comes to this point. This Ethiopian man comes to this point and says, you know what? I, here I picked you up on the road. You've explained the gospel to me. You've told me what it is to follow it. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and step forward and obey He could have had a thousand reasons and a thousand excuses not to. I don't know this guy. This is some random man running up to my car driving down the road. Yelling at me. I don't know this guy. He looks kind of Greek. I look kind of Sudanese. They would look very, very different. Okay? Philip would have had more of a, you know, tan, olive skin kind of face. The Ethiopian eunuch would have been black. Who is this guy? Why would I, you know, why would I listen to him? Besides, he's a Jew, and Jews do you know, I go to worship in Jerusalem because I'm, I think that's the right God. But the Jews, they lock the doors on me because I'm a eunuch. You go back into the Old Testament law, and he wouldn't allow past a certain line. Here I travel all this way. Besides, I'm important. This guy looks a little threadbare. A little confused. Besides, what do I do with all this? But instead he says, you know what? I know this is true. The Spirit of God has confirmed this truth in my heart. I've read this in the Scripture. This is what I'm looking for. I'm not going to wait to walk in obedience to God. I'm not going to stumble in this. I'm not going to hold back. I am going to go forward. Further, we see that when Philip is told to go to the road, he goes immediately. He doesn't start offering excuses. He doesn't start making plans. He just goes. He's told to run up by the, by the chariot. He goes. He hears the man reading scripture. And he interrupts him. Disrupts his life a little bit. And they come up out of the water. The unit goes on rejoicing. Philip turns up in Azatos, which is Ashdod, up the road a wee bit. And yes, we have lots of trouble trying to explain exactly how he went from there to there because it just says he found himself there. doesn't say that they were there or that he walked there. And then he goes on up and he continues preaching. Proclaims the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And that does not mean he got to Caesarea and quit preaching. It means he got to Caesarea and quit going. He stayed and kept preaching. And we'll find him later. He preaches. His kids preach. He has four daughters who preach. We get them in a few more chapters. But throughout, when there is the opportunity to walk in obedience, what you see through this whole story is even though you've got all these barriers, you've got cultural barriers, you've got physical barriers, you've got you know, physical fitness barriers, 
You've got the barrier of having to listen to the Holy Spirit, which is not something that any of these folks are truly that used to yet. Most of their life they have done, this is what's printed on the paper, this is what the priest tells me to do. And they haven't had a whole lot of, and I hear the voice of the Lord speak directly to me and tell me to do this. But they don't hesitate to walk in obedience. So why are we waiting? What are you waiting for? What is the thing that is holding you back from whatever it is that God has told you to do? Why are you waiting? God has told you to repent of that sin in your life that you've been holding on to desperately for years and years and years, and you don't want to let it go because you like it. Because it makes you happy. Because if it didn't make you happy, you wouldn't have started in the first place. And yet the Spirit of the Lord weighs on you every day. Repent. Set aside. What are you waiting for? God's told you this is the next step of obedience for you. You need to go do that. Of all the good and scary news out of the Southern Baptist Convention, one piece is this. The International Mission Board has started back what's called the Master's Program for International Missions, which is a program designed for, it doesn't pay a salary, but it is a fully funded, expenses covered, six-month to two-year term of International Mission Service for senior adults, where they're looking for people with experience with life that can go help spread the gospel to the nation. See, there's no sense to be trying to sell, sell, you know, most of it, just about anybody in this room on, you know, the 19-year-old, the, the program for 19-year-olds. But y'all know there are ways that you can say yes and go and serve God as a missionary at, at 60 when you've never done it before in your life. They'll train you, they'll equip you, they'll help you go. Do everything from work with people in countries to share the gospel with them to being there with people who are there as missionaries, lifelong missionaries, who need, need a little help. So I don't know. All I know how to do is you know, fix stuff. This and that. You think missionaries did? Half the missionaries we got out there are preachers. You think they know how to fix stuff? They need help. Okay? What are you waiting for? What's in front of you? What barrier are you putting in? God can bring Philip to the right spot. He can bring the chariot right up by the water. And he says, what stops me from walking, from doing this now? What stops you from doing now what God has called you to do? You see, we like to talk. We like to come up with plans and excuses. We like to have this and that and the other. And, and we sometimes are so good at that. Well, we want to make sure we got everybody on board before we make a decision. Oh, we want to make sure we thought about every possibility before we decide to do that. Well, we just want to wait and see. Maybe there's just one more thing. And as a result, in your life, there's things that you meant to do 10 years ago. In our life in the church, there's things we should have done 20 years ago. In our lives as believers, there may be things that we should have done a long, long time ago. We say, oh, well, I should have done it then. Well, you didn't. What are you waiting for now? The best time to have done it would have been right then, but the next best time is right now. If God is still saying, do this, do it. So, oh, but I don't know. Quit my job and go to the, go to the world to, tell, to share the gospel? Yeah. Every day, tens of thousands of people die separated from the love of Christ. How much more do you need before that becomes a priority? Think 
figure out what it's going to take to, to, for us as a church to reconnect with children, young people, young adults in this community to try to reach the following, following generations for Christ. It still holds that about 90% of people in the United States of America hold to the same religious beliefs and practices they had when they turned 21. So if we don't reach people before they turn 21, how much harder is it? What does it take? What are we waiting for? <clears throat> How many further excuses do we intend to give to the Lord God Almighty when we said, when He puts the opportunity there, we said, Oh, but I'm just not, I'm not sure. There's a time and a place for a committee, and there's a time and a place for action. You know, if the committee is working together to get to an action, it has no purpose at all, ever. We have got to develop a tendency and habit of walking in action and in active obedience. Because the Lord God Almighty did not make us a church that we could become a debating society. He didn't make us a church so that we could come together and just come, fill our spots, listen to some guy talk for half an hour, and then go home. We're called to move toward action. To run toward those who need the gospel. And to find ourselves wherever it is that God makes, has to show up. Philip could have stayed and all that time he could have said, you know, I think Jerusalem is just a happy place for me. <laughs> he could have said Samaria was nice and, and comfy, things had gone well. Instead, the Spirit said, go. Go from Jerusalem to Gaza, which wasn't a pleasant trip. Philip said, go. Or the Spirit said, go. And the Spirit put him in Azotus, which is not a place that very, very, very many nice Jewish people found themselves at the time. It's very wrong. Works his way up to Caesarea. As far as we can tell, it's where he makes his home. God moves him. Relocates him, put, keeps him at work. An Ethiopian eunuch walks in obedience, and we can track certain parts of the history of the gospel coming to that region of the world in northern Sudan, back to this incident. And from there, down the coast of Africa. Because one person walked in obedience. And then a second You know that if you do the math, if you start with one disciple and double it every six months, in five years you run out of people to make disciples of because you have gone around the whole world and run out of people.